Once again, we're excited to welcome you all to this second day of our, of our conference, Growing Hope, Practical Tools for our Changing Climate. My name is Lee Reinhardt, and I am an agriculture specialist with the National Center for Appropriate Technology, working on the Atra Project and Soil for Water and various other things. Um, today, we're going to be focusing on fertilizer reduction. We heard on Tuesday about the potential for sequestering carbon through agricultural practices, but we also need to look at ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. One of those ways is by managing soil fertility biologically. Agricultural production accounts for about 11% of total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions as of 2020. Synthetic fertilizers make up a large portion of those emissions, especially emissions of nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide from synthetic nitrogen production and use. Reducing or eliminating the use of synthetic fertilizers will be key to reducing overall greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture. Luckily, we have a multitude of examples of how to do this, and that will, uh, of how to do this, um, that will in the long run be economically and ecologically beneficial to all types of farms and ranches. In today's conference session, we're going to hear from Mark Schonbeck from the Organic Farming Research Foundation to look at the latest research in biological um, soil fertility. And then we're going to hear from Emily Oakley of, Th of Three Springs Farm in Oklahoma and Dave Scott of Montana Highland Lamb. They're going to be sharing their stories of how they're working towards sustainable soil fertility management. We've all seen in the past couple of years how fragile the global supply chains can be and how volatile prices are for inputs like fertilizer. If farmers can develop ways to build and maintain soil fertility biologically in ways that aren't impacted as greatly by the market volatility, it will make their farming operations much more resilient. So right now we wanna acknowledge our sponsors for the conference, which is actually free for all attendees this year. That's been made possible by the generous support of NCAT Atra Sustainable Agriculture, through USDA Rural Development, through Rural South Institute, Western SARE, the Hemp Industries Association, and Clearwater Credit Union. Thank you so much. The Hemp Industries Association started in 1994 as a group of hemp businesses and activist leaders where they came together with the shared goals of setting standards for hemp products and legalizing hemp in the U.S. To focus their efforts, they formed HIA, Hemp Industries Association, a volunteer-led, mission-driven, and democratically governed trade association. You can learn more about them at the HIA.org. So now, now I am in, uh, excited to introduce our first speaker, Mark Schonbeck. Mark has 35 years of experience as a researcher, a consultant, an educator, and an advocate for sustainable and organic agriculture. In his current role as research associate with Organic Farming Research Foundation, he reviews organic research um, outcomes, and he develops educational materials on soil health, climate resilience and mitigation, and crop, weed, and nutrient management for organic farmers. And now I'd like to welcome you, Mark, welcome you to Growing Hope, and I invite you to say, share your screen and kick us off with some good science. Thank you. Okay, let's see, share. Okay, and let's get it full screen. All right, well, thank you. Uh, very honored to uh, be part of this presentation. And uh, this is focused on organic methods, um, but it also based on some uh, interesting uh, research in conventional systems that have uh, led to the conclusion that we can use a lot less fertilizer than we had originally believed. So how did we get here? We have nitrate and phosphate in our streams and groundwater. We don't want them. We have more nitrous oxide in the air, degrading, eroding, tired soils, hungry crops aren't getting enough nitrogen at the right time, and the fertilizer bills are steep. Well, um, there's this uh, thing that I call 
uh, 20th century nutrient management. And the reason to dwell briefly on the past here is that it really has colored how um, current recommendations are still being um, developed and delivered. Uh, when the uh, first inexpensive at the time, uh, synthetic fertilizers, the Haber-Bosch process to make ammonia and everything, uh, the phosphates and the potassium chloride became widely available, farmers said, oh, okay, we could just put this down and meet crop needs. And uh, what happened is here is that soil life was not only disregarded, but it was considered to have a negative role in that it competes with the crop for that barrel full of fresh nutrients. And so the question is how much goes to the crop, how much goes to the soil life, soil organic matter, how much gets tied up in minerals. And then yeah, we have to admit there is some nitrate leaching. We didn't know anything about nitrous oxide emissions back then. Um, but, and then there was the runoff. So the recommendations are based on expected crop uptake plus estimated losses and tie up. And the yield trials are conducted in relatively depleted soils that have been over tilled and have not received cover crops. So these, these are the uh, research station soils of the late 20th century. And private service providers have two rather conflicting motivations, serve the farmer and sell fertilizer. So that actually is how we got here. Interestingly enough, uh, University of Illinois uh, started giving some, uh, doing some really interesting analyses of the moral plots. So these were established in the 19th century. And at the very beginning of the 20th century, there were three crop rotations established, uh, continuous corn, corn soy, and then corn oats alfalfa. And we know that only the last one is even vaguely sustainable. Uh, but then starting in 1955, they started using synthetic, uh, some of the subplots received a synthetic nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium treatment at a medium rate, pretty much recommended rates. And then starting in 1967, there were some other subplots which started getting a higher input rate. So there's this big sign at the Morals uh, Plot site still to this day says, the use of science and technology has increased crop productivity over fourfold. Uh, yes, when you narrowly look at it in terms of uh, yield per acre, that is true. Uh, when I looked up the moral plots in the Wikipedia, they had a very important um, additional principle, and that is soil quality is a vital component of agricultural productivity, as we all know, and that crop rotation helps prevent the depletion of soil quality. Still seeing an awful lot of corn soy desert in the Midwest right now. However, we are growing bigger crops. We're making more residues. We're putting more roots in the ground. So we must be building soil organic matter, right? Interestingly, um, the uh, researchers collected soil samples, zero to six, six to 12 and 12 to 18 inches in 1955 and did it again in 2005 and compared the um, soil organic carbon uh, content and soil organic carbon is about 0.5 times soil organic matter. So they're very tightly coupled. And then also looked at uh, soil organic nitrogen reserves, which is that reserve from which the soil life draws to make nitrogen available to crops uh, within the soil system. They found that on the fertilized plots, even though yields were doubled, especially the corn yields, there was no increase in soil organic carbon. And there was actually a decreased um, capacity for the soil to provide mineralizable soil nitrogen and the total organic nitrogen went down as well. The high treatment, which was putting on more than crops actually were withdrawing from the, uh, through harvest, sharply reduced the subsurface levels of soil organic carbon and total nitrogen. Very interesting and <laughs> uh, very telling result. And the other thing is they didn't notice any relationship between either exchangeable potassium or crop potassium status and whether or not the uh, soils received uh, the fertilizer, which included potassium chloride. Okay, then there was a study, there was a, um, a large meta-analysis across many locations um, and synthetic uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium trials. Um, there was a downward trend in total soil organic carbon, total downward trend in total soil organic nitrogen in the majority of these trials and accelerated soil nitrogen mineralization. And you think, oh good, the soil is providing more to the crop, but what's happening is the soil is depleting itself. 
because it's not receiving any organic nitrogen. It's just this uh, soluble nitrogen. And there was no real correlation, again, between potassium fertilization and soil test potassium. Uh, only in about a quarter of the trials, so this is a large number of short-term trials, and only about a quarter of those did the crop show a response to the potassium fertilizer. And there were sometimes negative effects of the potassium chloride fertilizer on crop yields, on crop quality, excuse me. And it turns out that the use of potassium chloride, especially when it's more than necessary, tends to collapse soil structure and reduce cation exchange capacity. So what are the lessons learned from all this? Well, synthetic fertilizers, no, they don't build uh, soil organic carbon. And if you're putting it above the crop demand, the nitrogen will actually burn up soil organic carbon. And the authors concluded we need to base nitrogen management on soil biological nitrogen mineralization. This gets around to biological nutrient management, uh, taking a site-specific approach, um, and synchronizing that application with actual crop demand. And interestingly enough, there was another one uh, paper by uh, the Con uh, uh, 2000, um, I had that wrong, it's Con 2013, sorry folks. It'll be in your written notes, there'll be some written notes as well as these uh, slides available. So I will have to jump over some of this. Uh, if you wanna dive deeper into some of these uh, questions and research details, uh, Check out the notes, check out the slides at your own, on your own time. Um, and this is where they found that the potassium chloride in particular um, is, can be harmful to soil as well as crop health. So what is the organic response? Yeah, you feed the soil and the soil will feed the crop. We know that right from the beginning, organic farmers were um, turning under cover crops, using manure and compost, organic mulches, um, uh, various crop residues avoiding synthetics and really paying attention to all the nutrients, not just nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So some of this thinking has actually come into what I call 21st century nutrient management. The soil microbes are at the table now. They're considered a, a, an important and functioning part of the soil ecosystem. The relationship between soil life and nutrient availability to crops is considered a two-way street. You could get tie-up or you can get some mobilization by the soil life. So you don't need as much NPK. You could cut back those fertilizer rates. Uh, you're still gonna get some runoff and leaching and uh, nitrous oxide emissions, as we all know. Uh, I call this the feed the crop and the soil approach. Um, manure and legumes are now in, uh, uh, considered in nitrogen crediting. And uh, the recommendations include uh, avoiding excesses to protect water quality and uh, crop rotation is recommended, uh, not quite widely taken up as we see with the corn soy uh, phenomenon. Here's another aspect. Uh, NRCS has introduced the four R's of nutrient management, right source, right rate, right timing and right placement. Very interesting and, and important concepts and we'll see a little later how well they apply to organic systems. Soil test interpretation and recommendations. Uh, when you get a soil test, you get a number, and then hopefully they will give you a rating, very low, low, medium, high, or optimum, or very high. And very high is anything from ample to excess, uh, surplus, and even maybe a destructive excess. So you, know, you really don't want to be in the very high zone. And the interpretation, it means that if you're low, you're likely to get a yield response. You definitely need to make up that deficit one way or another. Medium 50-50, you can grow crops on medium uh, levels of nutrients. And if your biology is good, very often you get a good yield. High means you're in the optimum range. You're not likely to see any yield response from putting any more on. So why not save the money? And two other caveats with this. Um, there, the nitrogen is rarely tested directly unless you ask for a nitrate nitrogen uh, test at a specific stage of the cropping year. It's typically the pre-side dress nitrate test for corn. And it can be done for other crops as well. And as uh, Khan et al. 2013, correction on that date once again, um, the soil test potassium and their exchangeable potassium does not a reliable indicator of what the crop can see and obtain. So Look at some soil test recommendations, and these are for soils testing high or optimum in soil P and K. Uh, Virginia Tech, uh, I looked up their recent uh, uh, manual for vegetable production, 
And even in the high range, they're recommending 50 to 100 pounds per acre of phosphate, 50 to 100 pounds per acre of potash. And if you look down at the last three crops on that nutrient removal list, you'll see that the phosphate application, even for maintenance, is quite a bit higher than uh, what the crop is going to harvest off. So you're going to slowly build up a surplus. And they sometimes even recommend a little bit of P and K for very high, uh, which doesn't really make any sense. It's like, why spend the money? Now, the private lab that I work with, uh, they were doing pretty much the same thing, recommending a maintenance or slightly above maintenance, especially for vegetables on phosphorus. Um, and uh, sometimes recommending a little phosphate even for a very high reading. Okay, so I went online and I was actually encouraged by what I saw. I just said, uh, land grant university recommendations uh, based on soil tests. Um, a number of these uh, universities are now either going to maintenance or zero. And the maintenance is estimating how much the crop is gonna remove in, its, in the harvest based on yields and the type of crop you're growing. And they're just putting that much on and no more. Um, these six um, these six land grant universities consistently said, don't put anything on if it's very high. And they varied from nothing to maintenance for the high range. Uh, University of Missouri had an interesting uh, statement here that nearly all soils in Missouri require nitrogen for optimum production of crops. Well, we'll check that out a little later. It's not entirely true, at least not in the Southeast where the soils are even poorer in an inherent, an inherent fertility. Um, but to their credit, they began to start crediting uh, nitrogen for soil organic matter based on that and soil texture, estimating uh, biological nitrogen mineralization. So we're beginning, we're making some real progress. Um, uh, Robin Clute uh, gave a, a presentation at an organic conference in 2017 and then an NRCS webinar in 2018 he did a study for five years on a, um, a coastal plain loamy sand. It was um, uh, Orangeburg loamy sand. Now, this is an ultisol, a kind of soil uh, where a lot of the clays and fertility were leached out of the topsoil and deposited in a clay enriched uh, subsoil, often separated by a compaction layer or E horizon. And uh, so these are difficult soils to work with. Uh, he did an organic corn, soy, wheat rotation with cover crops. And then he tried, um, that's another error. That's supposed to be an N. We don't really apply hydrogen to um, uh, crops. So that's nitrogen at 50 and 100% recommended rate. Um, phosphorus and potassium, either zero or the recommended rate. The results are pretty outstanding. The organic system built that soil organic matter by from 1.2 up to 1.7% in five years. And for a loamy sand, that is an excellent result. Uh, you got full grain yields with a half nitrogen rate and no phosphorus or potassium. And the soil pot potassium and phosphorus levels did not show depletion, even though he was not replenishing uh, what was harvested off. And he's uh, reported 13 different trials in other states, uh, totally different soil types, uh, different climates, similar results. If you have a good organic system, you've got healthy soil, your fertilizer needs are a fraction of what you'll see on your soil tests. And his comments was basically living soil changes everything. And the soil test uh, protocols still uh, overlook that. So yeah, I call it tiny but mighty because um, the soil weight, the soil volume, only about 0.2% of it is made up of living organisms but they are responsible for all of the functions of a healthy soil, including holding and delivering nutrients, um, breaking down fresh residues to make uh, soil organic matter and plant nutrients, protecting water quality by hanging onto those nutrients so they don't just leach out or wash out uh, off the field. And then they do other things, um, improve moisture storage uh, that protects plants from disease because uh, most of those organisms are really beneficial and they just crowd out the pathogens. Um, and their activities maintain structure and drainage and aeration. And of course, the building organic matter and sequestering carbon, by the way, uh, same thing. And so all of those other properties are important for healthy roots and therefore for crop nutrition. And when all of those are in place, your, your fertilizer needs go down even further. 
So this is just a, a diagram. It's based on uh, a diagram by Ray Weil in his uh, most recent version of Nature and Property of Soils, Weil and Brady, 2017. Um, and I just uh, took it and uh, doctored it up a little bit to show the flows. The blue is the plant um, photosynthetic product. It comes out as root exudates, 10 to 40% of every of all the plant photosynthetic product is donated to that uh, rhizosphere microbiome by root exudates. And then we have these eager fungi that say that I don't wanna wait outside the root, they grow into the root and form these arbuscules. And these are these highly beneficial mycorrhizal fungi. They double or triple the root system uh, efficacy. I mean, you basically effectively triple the uh, root volume. And so they're taking up nutrients all through the soil. And the bacteria and fungi that are living near the root uh, then become food for uh, nematodes and protozoa. And when they eat uh, the tinier microbes, they release more nutrients right by the root, which is where you want it. Turns out the fossil record has documented that this is a relationship that has occurred for 450 million years. That is when land plants and their mycorrhizal fungi co-evolved to be able to begin to turn dirt into soil. So how does this happen? Um, of course, uh, the soil microbiome just consumes all the organic matter, the residues, the manure, the root exudates, the sloughed roots, and this pool of organic matter called active soil organic matter. It's been processed one, but it's once, but it's been able to be processed again. And as the organisms go about their business, they not only keep that active organic matter replenished, they make some stable organic matter, which is uh, used to be called humus. It turns out that it's mineral associated organic matter and that is long-term carbon sequestration. And that CO2 production that, yeah, you think it's a greenhouse gas, but it's very important because that is how, it's the, it's the process of breaking some of this down that the uh, microbes are providing nitrogen and other nutrients to the plant. So what we need to do is to feed the soil microbes, not the plant necessarily. Okay, well, this is a great micrograph because you see this, this bacterial fuzz hanging out around the root zone. That rhizosphere has 10 times more bacteria per cubic centimeter, whatever you want to say, than the bulk soil. And with all that goody stuff growing, then all of the, uh, those larger uh, objects are various protozoa coming in to, to feast. And, and then they uh, release the nitrogen and other nutrients. So what we want is a management system that enhances root exudation. And there was an excellent review article in the uh, Journal of Soil and Water Conservation uh, by uh, Prescott and others in 2021. And there are three main practices that enhance root exudation. First is to avoid providing more nitrogen and phosphorus than the crop really needs. You want the nitrogen and phosphorus rates just a little below the optimum for top growth. And what happens is the plant's photosynthetic rate is not affected by this very, very slight nitrogen phosphorus deficit. And the same for water. You want to water moderately. You don't want to really like completely baby them and max out the water supply. So keep those three elements just a little lean. And what happens is photosynthesis is un, 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 unchanged. Yield at quality is unchanged. However, the top growth, the vegetative growth slows down just a little bit and the plant has all of this extra photosynthate. And what it does sends it down to the roots out into the rhizosphere, lots of root exudates up towards the upper end of that 10 to 40% range. The microbes thrive and they're making more mineral associated organic matter and they're recycling more nutrients back to the crop. Another thing, Although synthetic nitrogen and other forms of very concentrated nitrogen deter this process, having legumes in the rotation enhances it. The legumes have a particularly nourishing root exudate for these microbes. And the third thing is if you do rate, uh, rotational grazing, you wanna time it to happen right towards the end of the rapid growth phase of the forage, which is when you have the most forage and it hasn't yet started to deteriorate in quality by getting over mature. If you bring them in too early and uh, you know, we've, before the, the forage is fully recovered, it's really bad for the pasture. And those are probably the situations where you hear that rotational grazing doesn't sequester carbon. Well, if you get the timing wrong, it doesn't. 
And another thing is, um, I say this to organic growers, don't be afraid to use shallow, judicious, non-inversion tillage, things like the speed disc, a rotary harrow, or even a rototiller, as long as you get the PTO speed down so you're not beating the heck out of the soil. And interesting that there was a, a meta-analysis that showed that this doubled the microbial biomass compared to either moldboard plow, which we know is destructive to soil health, or continuous no-till. And the authors attributed that to the restricted aeration and the surface sealing that often occurs in no-till fields. And I would add there are two other factors that may be going on here is that a lot of continuous no-till fields don't have winter cover crops. If you had a rye, radish, Austrian pea world cover crop, you better believe that soil is going to stay good and open and well-drained. And if you use herbicides that you often have to for continuous no-till, it may have some adverse effects on the soil microbiome. We know that all classes of agrochemicals, uh, crop protection chemicals, have some degree of adverse effect on just about every category of soil life, from the smallest microbe up to the biggest earthworm. So biologically based soil uh, nutrient management, this is kind of review because we've been talking about it for the last 15 minutes. But basically, the soil life plays a central role in converting all of the organic inputs into active soil organic matter, which is like a slow release reserve of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, the negatively charged macronutrients. Some of that becomes stable organic matter, which is bound to soil minerals as mineral associated organic matter. And that expands the soil's cation exchange capacity so that the calcium, magnesium, uh, potassium, and some of the micronutrients that were returned in those residues can be held in this plant available form, exchangeable form. And soil life also, and also plant roots and soil life together work on the primary minerals of the soil to slowly make more of these micronutrients and cations available to uh, living plants. So in this situation, you got, um, You've greatly reduced leaching and runoff uh, because it's biologically based. You don't have large quantities of soluble nutrients. So um, now NO, the National Organic Program does allow the careful use of concentrated fertilizers, things like poultry litter. And we'll, we'll get to the, they're kind of a double-edged sword. They're somewhere between uh, the um, organic residues on the one hand, the biologically based systems and the chemical fertilizers. Soil microbes need a balanced diet to do their job. They need the carbon to nitrogen ratio in the middle range. Um, if you have really high carbon to nitrogen inputs, the whole system becomes nitrogen starved. So what the soil life does is, okay, we're gonna take every last molecule of ammonium and nitrate out of the soil. Well, the crops are gonna suffer for a while, as you can see there on the left. Um, and that is why 20th century, late 20th century extension said, you can't do organic, you'll never have enough nitrogen. Well. Maybe. <laughs> so anyway, if you use these high con carbon residues as a surface mulch, you get less nitrogen tie up because there's only a thin contact surface uh, area between the soil surface and these very high carbon residues, provided there is enough uh, nitrogen, active organic matter, maybe a little bit of uh, uh, compost has been tilled in that's, that's uh, more available. Um, but you can use it as a mulch and it protects the soil surface. You don't get that soil uh, surface sealing and you keep things uh, healthy uh, in the soil profile. Okay, the other extreme, low carbon and nitrogen, poultry litter. This is a very common organic fertilizer and it can be useful. However, if you rely on it too much, this is what happens. The soil life is starved for carbon. Where does it get the carbon? From the active organic matter. So you're burning up organic matter by putting on poultry litter. Maybe not quite as bad as that synthetic nitrogen that um, uh, Kahn and Mulvaney were discovering was destructive to the moral plots. However, uh, there is that tendency. And you will get some nitrate leaching and some nitrous oxide losses in this kind of a, a scenario. When it's balanced, you get the maximum amount of organic matter generated. And that's because the soil life has enough carbon and it has enough nitrogen. It's slow releasing nutrients to your crops and a lot of that, you get the highest percentage conversion of the organic inputs into active and stable organic matter. Another thing is that compost, finished compost, which will have a somewhat uh, smaller, lower nitri uh, carbon nitrogen ratio, around 15 to one, 20 to one for a good compost. 
that basically is like uh, mainlining active organic matter into the soil. Most of that is active, active uh, organic matter and will therefore increase that reserve of nutrients. And it also has a very interesting complementary and synergistic effect between the living plants, so your cover crops, your, your diverse rotation, and having a little bit of compost going in um, gives you more both carbon sequestration and nitrogen mineralization potential. So well, let's build an organic nutrient management roadmap. Um, so we'll take the four R's of nutrient management and apply it to organic systems. There are a few advantages that organic farmers have, like the, their practices focus on building soil health. So you'll tend to have higher nitrogen mineralization and higher nutrient cycling uh, capacity, higher cation exchange capacity. Not using synthetics protects that soil microbiome and the crop di uh, diversity builds the below ground diversity, which is important for all these functions. There's some real challenges. Well, how much nitrogen do I really need? It can be all over the map. Uh, that picture on the left is some beans that are doing okay, but they're kind of short of nitrogen. Uh, snap beans are not the greatest nitrogen fixer. So we roll crimped a cover, uh, cover crop of uh, pearl millet there, and it was, was not quite enough uh, nitrogen for the crop. The middle is a field that's just now transitioning into organic. It had been a conventional corn, soy, wheat for a number of years with, you know, it was no till, but getting the chemical inputs, and no cover crops. So it's pretty depleted. And that's going to delay mineralization as well. It's going to be difficult to sustain yield. And then if you use compost as your primary source of nitrogen or your primary source of organic matter, you will build up excess phosphorus very quickly, as we saw those earlier in those uh, nutrient balance uh, tables. So right source, a couple of questions, organic or biologically based or soluble? Uh, do you want to grow it in place or do you want to apply it as amendments? on farm or imported. Okay, so uh, these are several large global meta-analyses and also some uh, long-term farming systems trials in the United States, comparing organic versus soluble sources of NPK. What we find is the organic sources build organic matter, considerably reduce nitrate leaching and, nit and ammonia volatilization uh, the downside is it turns out that there's a little more nitrous oxide on the average in this one meta analysis. And we'll get, to, we'll get to why that happens and what can be done about it a little later. Um, organic fertilizers doubled the biomass of microbes and uh, both bacteria and events that meant to say bacteria and fungi. Um, and also the bacteria and fungal grazing nematodes. So you have more of those nematodes that are going to recycle the nutrients back to the crop. And they had a 35 to 100% higher potential to mineralize nitrogen from the organic matter and uh, supporting a more diverse microbiome with improved uh, phosphorus and nitrogen cycling and a reduction in pathogen loads. So a lot of positives there. Uh, one caveat around the nitrous oxide. Growing, so these are three organic nutrient sourcing strategies. And I strongly believe we need a little bit of all of them. You, need to, you do need to replenish some of what you harvest off at least some of the time, and um, you can grow some of it in place, but you need some of the other sources as well. Legume cover crops are great for nitrogen. Uh, the mycorrhizal crops improve phosphorus availability, and deep roots um, do retrieve substantial subsoil nutrients, including potassium from primary minerals, which is why you don't necessarily need to put them on as much potassium as you take off. On-farm nutrient cycling, returning all on-farm residues, whether it's you know coming out of the cotton gin uh, or uh, the manure from the barn, whatever. Uh, the on-farm philosophy tries to minimize off-farm inputs. Um, on the other hand, there are others like if you if you're uh, starting an urban farm and you've got a really depleted soil light that's been under a building for a long time, and yeah, it passed the lead test, you're not you know contaminated, but boy, is it really depleted. So. Uh, the other strategy is to start using society's organic residues. There's no such thing as organic waste until we waste it. So uh, all those tree leaves and food scraps and uh, zoo dung and whatever else that the city cranks out, if it's going on to community gardens to rebuild the soil, that's what we need to be doing. You need to be getting all those wastes out onto our farmland too at rates that are compatible with good nutrient management. And this higher inputs initially can help sustain yields during transition. So cover crops are really cool because they have all of these soil health benefits. And um, 
the, the legumes are fixing nitrogen, uh, the mycorrhizal species and the buckwheat, which has other uh, symbiosis, not mycorrhizal. They liberate phosphorus. You can have a low or medium phosphorus test. If you have these um, crops growing in the rotation, you may not need to add very much phosphorus. And then grasses, particularly grasses and trees and anything deep rooted are good to get in that subsoil mineral and potassium. On the other hand, if your P and K levels are high or very high, your cover crops are never going to give you more than you need. They're just going to use what's there. So this is an excellent example of on-farm nutrient cycling. Elmwood Stock Farm in Georgetown, Kentucky. It's a 800 member CSA uh, growing both meat, poultry and eggs and vegetables. Uh, they have 200 acres in this rotation. It's three years of vegetables or feed grains for their own livestock um, and five years in pasture. And they have uh, the rest of the areas in permanent pasture because it's steeper or not as good soil. And they only sell edible parts of their products. Uh, you know, they, they trim the meat down to the, the edible cuts um, and the vegetables, just whatever is, um, uh, would go to market anyway. Everything else goes back to the land. This is what's so amazing. Their annual off-farm inputs amount to less than a pound of nitrogen and phosphate and maybe 10 pounds of potassium uh, potash per acre on their 200 cropland acres. Uh, the permanent pasture is just the animals grazing and leaving their dung uh, in the field that is cycling nutrients. And they do feed their animals some salt and mineral seaweed supplements. So there is a little bit of input there as well. Uh, the outcome is that they're a very successful, uh, productive and profitable farm. And studies at the, um, uh, by the University of Kentucky uh, have shown that that pasture phase restores the cropland soil microbiome and organic matter back to the level that you see in the permanent pasture. So it's a cycle where you draw down for a few years with the vegetables and then it builds back up. So now we go on to off farm nutrient sources. And we're looking at the two most commonly used in organic farms. These aren't the only ones, but they're most commonly used. Compost with a carbon to H nitrogen ratio around 20 or fertilizer, which is poultry litter at around seven. There was a study in Washington state 11 year, uh, kind of mediumly long term, I would call it uh, vegetable organic systems trial. And they use these two at the same total nitrogen. And the result was after 11 years receiving compost, the soil's organic matter was 43% higher than with the poultry litter. The active soil organic matter, now this is the permanganate oxidizable uh, organic matter test, that was 62% higher and microbial activity was 30% higher. And the microbiomes were different. On the compost treated land, the capacity to mineralize nitrogen to meet crop needs was higher. And paradoxically, it also had a higher capacity to immobilize excess nitrogen and thereby limit nitrous oxide emissions. So going easy on the concentrated fertilizers is the first step towards dealing with that nitrous oxide uh, weak point in some organic systems. And you got better soil structure and water infiltration for the compost, as you might be able to imagine. And the yields were mostly comparable. There were two years where the vegetables did better on the poultry litter and two years where the wheat in the rotation actually did better with the compost. So here's the problem with these two favorite uh, go-to sources. Um, compost, typically, if it's a manure compost, it might be around 111. Now, I'm saying that you, you, you better go test your compost because they'd be all over the map. You have a plant-based compost that might be 1.5.7 or 1.2, one and then only 0.2 phosphorus, which means you can use a lot of it without building phosphorus. But if you have this 111 compost or you have a poultry litter fertilizer and you put it on at a rate that is going to meet the nitrogen requirement of one of these vegetables or is going to replenish the potassium, you're going to really load up phosphorus. So you really want to uh, calibrate, once your phosphorus is high or optimum, you want to calibrate compost and or poultry litter to just replenish the phosphorus. And you'll think you're just putting on fairy dust amounts of compost, but that is all you need if you have a tight crop rotation with high biomass cover crops. You just want to keep it in living roots as much as possible. And looking at the field crops, this is a very interesting thing to look at is that the potassium removal in a grain crop is surprisingly low. And there's a moderately high amount of phosphorus. So if you went on and just replenished phosphorus um, 
with your compost and poultry litter, fairly moderate rates, uh, and use legumes in your rotation to provide that nitrogen. Of course, the soybean fixes most of its own. Now, forage crops are different. If you graze them, you're getting a lot of the nutrients back in the manure. But if you hay them or cut them for silage, you are taking a lot of nitrogen, potassium, and a fair bit of phosphorus off that land. So you want to mix and match this to get the balance right. So if your soil is testing low in phosphorus, say, oh, great, this is a good time to put a lot of compost on to really build the organic matter, build the night phosphorus up to your optimum range, but you don't want to go higher because you start shutting down the mycorrhizal fungi with excess phosphorus, you lose a lot of uh, nitrogen cycling and micronutrient acquisition capabilities. So once you reach optimum, then you limit those inputs to just replenish the phosphorus. And if it's higher, you, I would say, don't use any manure, use compost, a plant-based compost, use it fairly sparingly. And then you can use legume cover crops. I mean, that's, that's the, the, the ace in the hole for the organic system. You depend a lot on legume crops to replenish nitrogen. And if you need a quick fix, there are some low nitrogen, uh, low phosphorus nitrogen fertilizers, even Chilean nitrate, which is, is actually a soluble fertilizer. If it's used in very small amounts right in the row, it does not seem to have the adverse effects on the soil's health and the soil capacity to cycle nutrients. All right, how much do we need? There's this concept called the economic optimum nitrogen rate. And it's a function of the yield response, the fertilizer price, and any additional value that the farmer may place on resource stewardship. Now with fertilizers getting expensive as a result of the war in Ukraine, uh, the EONR might go even lower. Um, and the yield response itself is a function of soil health, how well the soil is already meeting uh, nutrient needs, and management history. So we really wanna credit nit nitrogen mineralization uh, from the soil organic matter, as well as from manure and cover crops. Um, and the surplus, if you get surplus soil nitrogen, it'll, it'll tend to reduce the mineralization capacity and it'll definitely increase nitrous oxide. Okay, so early, early in the days when organic was just beginning to get accepted, this is around late 90s, early 2000s. I remember they were looking at compost and saying, well, it's nitrogen availability is only 10 to 25%. So if we want to do an agronomic rate, what they called it back then, you want to get 100 pounds of available nitrogen to your crop from the compost, you'd have to put on huge volumes, 20 to 50 tons per acre, rapidly building up phosphorus excesses, other nutrients can be excessive too. And you know, at a multi-acre scale, it gets economically infeasible. Compost is not cheap. The other thing they do is say manure and legumes are worth 50%. So you say, okay, let's put some manure on that legume and till it all under so we have enough for our corn. That is when you get the huge bursts of nitrous oxide. And those are probably the circumstances that contributed to that meta-analysis finding. This is my speculation, but I think that as contributed to the nitrogen uh, excesses uh, those high that increase in nitrous oxide emissions in organic nutrient sources. There was another meta-analysis. This is excellent news. If you substitute your organic nitrogen, like finished compost, even which is a very slow release, at uh, base on total nitrogen, the organic maintained the yield and reduced nitrogen losses by thirty percent. If you base it on soluble nitrogen or available nitrogen, the increased yield actually a little bit like the organic source, but you get increased losses, including nitrous oxide. So uh, for, uh, Dr. Uh, Alan Franz Lubers and colleagues in North Carolina State University have been developing this really promising soil health test. It's soil test biological activity. Basically you dry out some soil, and you put it under very careful laboratory conditions, rewet it to 50% moisture and let it respire for three days and see how much is there. Turns out that it's a very reliable indicator of almost all the other soil health parameters, including soil nitrogen potential, capacity to supply crops with their nitrogen. And he looked at a wide range of soils with a wide range of soil test biological activity values in Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. We don't really have that. We have those altosols that are, everybody says, oh, they're infertile. They have a low inherent fertility. You really got to sock it to them. Well, 21 out of 57 forage fescue trials had an EONR of zero. That was before the war broke out and pushed fertilizer prices up now. So that's probably up in the 30s now. 
Six out of 12 corn silage trials, 12 out of 36 corn grain trials. Now, these are not light feeders. And another trial with vegetables in Clemson, South Carolina, a SARI funded project. They were growing summer squash and tomato after rye and crimson clover yielded well, no response to nitrogen. Now here's a counterexample: organic broccoli. Um, studies in California and Washington. Now this is a high value crop, so you're going to have you're going to have more um, economic return for your nitrogen as long as the crop's responding to it. But we had ENRs above 200 pounds per acre, but some of those studies showed that that could leach two thirds, three quarters of that nitrogen as nitrate to your groundwater and a significant amount of nitrous oxide emissions. And that's, uh, those emissions are enough to um, negate around a ton of soil carbon sequestration per acre per year. So <clears throat> at a big cost, probably this is a broccoli harvest only removes about a quarter to a half of that nitrogen. So why is this so inefficient? Why is it responding when it only needs like 60 pounds to provide your harvest. Well, part of it is this is a Mediterranean climate where it rains in the winter. And when they're growing the broccoli in the summer, these are cool, rainy winters, just isn't very good growing conditions, very dark, you know, especially up in Washington state. Uh, and then the growing season is dry, you have to drip irrigate. So uh, the nitrogen may not be mineralizing that efficiently and getting to the crop. Um, and then the winter rains wash all the excess away. Uh, broadcasting, and they were also broadcasting the nitrogen, and uh, broccoli doesn't have a very big root system. It tends to be small and restricted close to the plant. So I'm thinking that maybe you band it, you might get a little bit more uh, efficiency. Also, I think modern bro broccoli cultivars may be uh, poor efficiency of nitrogen use. Third R, right timing. <clears throat> this is a big issue because what happens is if, you're, if you put organic nitrogen on, you don't know how quickly it's going to mobilize and it comes out, it, it's mineralized faster than the crop's nitrogen uptake, then a lot of it's going to leach away and the crop's going to be short of nitrogen. <clears throat> if it mobilizes too slowly, same thing. The crop doesn't get enough. And then in the fall, you have nitrate leaching and some nitrous oxide emissions. Um, for example, do we till the cover crop in? With a, with a speed disc, you mow it and till it, or do we want to roll crimp it and try to plant no-till? Well, if you're up in Iowa or Minnesota and you got this wonderful mollusol silt loam and, and it's super fertile, it's like, um, you know, it's uh, productivity index might be 0.9 or something. And you go and roll crimp your cover crop and you're waiting for the big yield and you get a lousy yield and you get, and you get uh, nitrogen losses. Whereas if you did till it in, it would have been just ideal. It would have gone right to the crop. So, hey, Mark, we, hey Mark, we got about maybe five minutes or so um, and then to, to, until we're ready for a few questions. So just kind of to give you a heads up there. Thank okay. you. Okay, I'm a little behind, but not too bad. We'll just kind of buzz through this. Okay, thank you. Um, now the Southeast Coastal Plain, well, we might have a productivity index of 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and you think, ah, it's not gonna be too fertile. Maybe we better not roll crimp it. Well, it turns out on some of these sandy soils, it can actually release too fast if you were to till it in and, and you, get, you get the uh, losses and the poor efficiency with it tilled. And uh, if you roll crimp it, the timing might be just right. This is an amazing example. This is a, a study with broccoli in California again, and it was, Strawberry planted after broccoli, it was an organic rotation. The broccoli um, left behind almost 150 pounds in residues. And then there was a, a, a pre-plant application of organic nitrogen, another 100 pounds per acre for the strawberry. But what happened is the strawberry wasn't growing much until middle of the spring, like April, May. And that's when its nitrogen uptake took place. Well, the winter rains washed all that nitrogen away. The good news, this is another study in the Salinas Valley. Um, Eric Brennan was doing a spring lettuce fall broccoli organic cropping system. If the winter was fallow, all that nitrogen left over from the broccoli washed away and the spring lettuce gave either a crop failure or a half yield. If you grew any cover crop, even rye, which you think that's gonna tie up all the nitrogen. You grew rye, you grew mustard, he grew a legume mix, all did the same thing, supported an excellent uh, lettuce harvest because it retrieved all that nitrogen. 
right placement. Okay, this is an interesting study. This is this is the this is what we're after: getting the nutrients delivered right in the root zone by soil life acting on the organic matter and the organic residues. Just no chance for it to wash away. It all goes right into the plant. There was a study on organic tomatoes in California. This is fascinating. Uh, they looked at 13 different fields. Two of them are nitrogen deficient. The soil was not in great health and the manure was put on the fall before. Same thing as with the strawberries. So it was poorly timed and the yields were poor and the soil test nitrate levels were very low. Nitrogen saturated, they used concentrated sources like uh, bat guano and um, uh, poultry litter, and the result was you got good yields, uh, but you fairly high levels of soil nitrate. And uh, um, that was also uh, leaching potential. And there were four fields that showed low soluble nitrogen and full yields. What did they do here? They used finished compost for most of the nitrogen. And they used a little bit of concentrated nitrogen in the row. Now, some of them actually use Chilean nitrate. You think, well, that's almost like doing conventional fertilizer. But it turns out a little bit of soluble nitrogen just to get the crop over the hump supports your yield without undermining the soil's capacity to mineralize nitrogen. So there's a fifth R, this one, the NRCS didn't come up with this, I came up with it. We need crop cultivars that are nutrient efficient, they have robust root systems, and they support beneficial organisms to the max. And our current cultivars were bred and selected for or conventional production, and they didn't have any. Um, they have weakened capacity to enter into these beneficial relationships. Um, Dr. Walter Goldstein, Goldstein at the Mondaman Institute found some, uh, uh, some land races of corn that have host so many nitrogen fixing bacteria in their roots, even though they're not nodulated, uh, that they can provide 40% of their nitrogen just from that alone. And their whole microbiome is efficient at using nitrogen from organic sources like soil organic matter. So this pictures on the right is a trial he conducted with his hybrids that had incorporated this land race germplasm versus standard hybrids on a soil in Africa that was pretty low fertility. I think it was probably an oxisol, which is even more uh, leached out than an ultisol. So anyway, on the left, you got standard hybrid, and those are the tiny ears that it made on the top on the right. On the right, you have the uh, nitrogen efficient corn thriving and giving a beautiful yield. So there are other land races. Um, now there are other crops in which there is significant genetic variability that can be used for plant breeding, uh, carrot, pepper, corn, um, sorghum, other grains and legumes vary in how much they, they host mycorrhizal fungi. So my question is, can we breed broccoli to and select it for nutrient efficiency so that we can enjoy this wonderful vegetable without such a huge nitrous oxide footprint? And there are three pages of just general tips. And I think my time is out. I think I'll let the farmers cover the practical side of this. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Excellent, Mark. Um... Wow, I really am glad that you are making the PowerPoint and the notes available because mm. um, there's so much there. We have a couple of questions, um, but again, uh, the IT folks have shared those links with everyone in the chat. You can go to that and download that, um, and you can have that for your reference, and you can uh, do some deeper diving into some of uh, uh, what Mark has been talking about. Um, but we do have a couple of questions here before we kind of switch over to our farmer panel. And one of them, uh, someone asked, and I don't know, I'd never heard of this, maybe you have. Uh, could Mark comment on the potential for wool fertilizer for organic vegetable production? Are you familiar? You mean sheep's wool? Yeah, that's what it says. I guess there's a, a, a link to a UVM, Vermont wool, and other natural fibers. So I was wondering if you heard anything about that. I, I always think that wool should be used to make clothing, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as a fertilizer, I would imagine it would be a fairly slow release. I don't know enough about it. I have heard of this. It seems kind of strange to me, but okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I would suspect that it will be, um, it'll behave more as a slow release uh, fertilizer rather than something like feather meal, but I would have to look at an analysis to see. Mm, okay. 
Uh, well, I I didn't know anything about it, so um, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna follow that link and see what I can find out. Yeah, um, sounds a good plan. You know, earlier you were you were talking about um, you know fertilizers and kind of impl making some implications on how it has how it affects soil life and this and that. I just read just this week a study, a 2022 study at the University of Illinois. The authors show that in a 30 plus year experiment on monoculture corn cover crops had a limited impact on the soil properties, on the nitrogen cycling, on the, the, those, those microbial communities, on their functionality. And they were suggesting that the soil environment and its nitrogen cycling communities became resistant to changes over decades long adaptation to these consistent disruptions from heavy nitrogen fertilization. So they concluded that a short-term cover crop may not be enough to improve heavily disrupted nitrogen cycling communities. So Mark, what do you think are the implications of something like this study? So they became resistant, they became unresponsive to soil health practices, or they became resistant to the effects of the fertilizers? Um, they became, uh, the way I interpreted it is that the soil microbes be, kind of became, they evolved into a situation where they were being getting to, where they were getting like 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And then whenever they would use cover crops and try to use the biological um, nitrogen fixation for cover crops, um, they didn't, they didn't see a, a response, mm -hmm. right? That, that there was a limited impact on those, on the nitrogen cycling from adding cover crops because those microbes had evolved to to just use whatever they got from the grocery store, right? Uh, I I don't I don't doubt it. I would love to see the reference. In fact, I would recommend you send it out to everybody on this webinar. Ooh, I can't wait deal. to read it. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's the same university that Khan and Mulvaney came out with this damning evidence out of the out of the moral plots. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are seeing so many smoking guns that. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. And whenever I, whenever I read, I mean, this is 30 years of continuous corn, continuous corn, right? And then yeah. they started putting the cover crops on and they didn't see any response. And, but they had only had the cover crops on for two years. So, you know, my questions are how long does it take for us to regenerate these soils that we have been um, just hammering, right? Over decades and decades and decades, you know, there is maybe there five to 10, I would say. And, you know, um, in general, all these soil microbial inoculants that are supposed that are sold to organic farmers aren't worth very much because those bugs are already in your soil. You've been taking care of it. But I bet they would be helpful here. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is diversify, diversify, diversify. Like don't grow corn or grow it mm -hmm. every five years. Right. And you know, throw in uh, legumes, vegetables, cereal grains, oil seeds, a meadow for this. five years, something like that. You know. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Put it just just plant it to prairie for ten years and walk away. <laughs> <laughs> let it let it heal, right? Well, it just it just you know they had said in the paper it's like you know millions of years it took for the soil organisms to you know, evolve in symbiosis with plants and such. And then 30 years of continuous corn just really untrained them, I guess, you know. Yeah. So I just I just thought it was fascinating. I'll see if I can't share that with everybody. Um, we're up at one o'clock now. And yeah. uh, I I, I want to thank you, Mark. Um, sure. That that was that was a graduate school for 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 organic soil uh, science and my in and, and, and microbiology. Uh, and it certainly, it certainly wasn't enough. And I'm so I'm glad that you were able to supply us with your notes. If you guys will look at those notes, he's got some pretty extensive um, references uh, in there where all of his work is cited and you can go and you can dig even deeper into some of these concepts. So again, Mark, really appreciate you. Sure. Okay, um, we're all coming back now and we get to talk with, with Emily and Dave. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to, I'd like to kind of introduce, um, our farmer panel who are going to kind of talk about what they've been doing to reduce fertilizer use on their farms. 
Um, so today we have with us um, Emily Oakley, who is a co-owner of Three Springs Farm, a diversified certified organic vegetable farm in eastern Oklahoma. Um, Michael Apple, her partner, was not able to join us. He had um, other things that he needed to do on the farm today. Um, so um, we're gonna we're gonna be speaking with Emily. So Emily and Mike cultivate more than 400 different crops and more than 150 individual varieties on three acres of land. Um, their goal is to maintain a two-person operation that demonstrates the economic viability of small-scale farming while minimizing the use of external fertility inputs. And after we hear from Emily, um, Dave Scott is going to join us for a little bit. He has 40 years of experience with adaptive multi-pedic grazing, first with dairy cows, and the last 19 years with sheep. And presently, he and his um, wife operate Montana Highland Lamb with 200 ewes and 300 lambs, and they're grazing 32 acres of irrigated pasture in southwest Montana. So they have uh, been able to develop a regenerative system that has eliminated nitrogen fertilization on their pastures. Um, also, uh, Dave is also a, uh, um, a very good friend of mine and a retired livestock specialist for the National Center for Appropriate Technology. Technology. So uh, with that, I'm going to say, Emily, start us off. Um, after after uh, you speak about your operation and Dave does, um, I'll open a conversation and then we can take some audience questions as, as well. So Emily, welcome. Great. Thank you. I'm trying to get it on my slide. Yeah, that'll be that, that'll be that little. Uh, yeah, screen it's covered up the... by my. It's covered. Oh, it up is by my yeah. Zoom. Yeah, then hit. Yeah, just go down here and hit slideshow. Right, that's on the top uh, bar. It says slideshow. Okay. That'll yes. That'll probably hang do on because I also have my slideshow. Got it. Do I want to play, or mm -hmm. do I just? Hmm. This yeah. is what happens when you get a farmer. Yeah, there. Well, you did it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for having me. And um, oh, we're excited. Really, oh, well, thank you. I appreciate a little bit going after Mark, but also it's slightly intimidating because, you know, he's so great. Um, this is the light version of the application of this on our farm. And can you guys see this? zoom screen as well or is it showing you we're seeing the, the yeah we're seeing the slide mm -hmm. great okay excellent all right so we're a vegetable farm and we are certified organic for our first three years we um we were in the city of tulsa and we were actually on leased land so that was um you know a great experience but for the past 16 years we've been on our own 21 acres that we own. We have about two and a half in annual vegetable production at any given time. And then we have the same amount in a rotational cover crop and fallow. We are just a two person farm. So, you know, we, we are basically <laughs> just focusing on our labor. We do have some help from a friend who helps us on our harvest days. It is our full-time income. So we do not have another job. This is it. Um, and we have a 300 member CSA, which is how we market our crops. We used to be at a market, but after COVID, we've just been doing the CSA. That's over about a 21 week period, just kind of depends on the year. Um, and then we are starting our 20th season right now. So when we first bought our farm, um, it was a very weathered old soil that had been in pasture for many, many decades and also hay, and it had five pounds of nitrogen to the acre. So that was a bit of a tricky place to start from. We have always cover cropped even from the first fall, but given those nitrogen amounts, we did apply chicken litter to all of our fields the first two years. We are in an area where there is almost no commercial compost available and no other manure source. And so uh, even though we initially had application or concerns about litter application just from not only a philosophical point of view but you know just what was in the litter itself 
we really didn't have a tremendous amount of options. So after those first two years of applying litter um, across the farm, over the next six years, we applied litter or manure on every other field with decreasing amounts over the years. And I mean, obviously you start getting phosphorus buildup as well. So, uh, you know, it, it, that was definitely something that we were starting uh, to see. And then in 2016, we stopped using any manure on the farm at all. Um, so some of our other inputs that we've used, we have applied lime at various different times because of our naturally five and a half pH soils are very acidic. But once we stopped applying the litter and we started thinking about, well, okay, well, what do we do next? We, um, we took kind of a year off. And then in 2017 and 18, we applied organic fertilizer mixes. And those were based largely off of submitting our soil test results and you know, getting a sense then of what they thought we should be applying based on those results. But after doing that for two years, we, came, we became a little bit concerned that we just replaced this chicken manure, which is inherently from CAFOs or confined animal feeding operations, um, with other byproducts of the CAFO industry, mostly feather meal and bone meal and other mined nutrients. And you know, just that looking at the inputs and where they come from and what the story behind them is, was a big part of what brought us to farming in the first place. So we wanted to be sure that, you know, what we did on our farm was reflective, not just of our concern for our soils on site or the environment on site, but the broader environment as well. So in 2019 and 2020, we applied pelleted soybean meal and that we broadcast over the entire farm. And that was partially because, you know, it's difficult, I think, to get off of this mentality that we need to be supplementing nitrogen. And uh, it helped us, I think, wean us to the place where we are now, which is that since 2021 and 2022, We've grown almost all of our veggies only on the cover crop residue. Um, so we did do some side dressing of soybean meal on our long-term crops, like basically the tomatoes, the eggplant, the peppers, the heavier feeders. But the rest of the crops that we grew were sourcing their nutrients from previous applications of uh, micronutrients and NPK and from the cover crop residue. So 2023 is our 20th season farming overall and our uh, 17th on this land, but it'll be our eighth season of no manure of any kind, our fifth season of no animal byproducts of any kind, and our third season of no imported NPK, except for the small amounts of side dressing that I just referred to. So cover crops have, as I said, always been a really big part of our system, and they certainly are now because, you know, we're just experimenting with to what extent can we grow our fertility, uh, given that, of course, we're now starting with soils that have had amended nutrients over the years. So for our fall winter cover crop, we do an oats, vetch, daikon, mustard, and clover mix, and, you know, we might throw in something additional just depending upon the season. We sow it as early in September as we possibly can so that we can get maximum vegetative growth before our daylight hours start diminishing and growth starts slowing down. And it will winter kill in December or January, just kind of depending upon what the weather is like each season. And the vetch will start to grow back. Actually, it's starting to grow really heartily right now. So sometime in February, it usually starts getting a big kickoff again. Then for our summer cover crop, we've got a sorghum Sudan grass, sun hemp, sunflower, cowpeas, safflower, and soybean mix, which we plant in July, and then incorporate again as early in September as we possibly can. We mow that down one or two times, depending upon growth, um, but also to encourage some root growth at that time. And uh, this is actually a picture of tilling in the summer cover crop and getting ready to plant uh, the fall winter cover crop in late September. So this rotation of um, our fields, especially in terms of that fallow period, 
it's not doing quite the same thing that Mark talked about in terms of, you know, going for like a five-year optimal period of grazing, but it is giving us um, a solid year of fallow with a cover crop, um, plus let's say another half year. So we're getting some sort of uh, like a fallow lay period in there with the cover crop um, to cash crop cycle. So we divide our, our growing fields into four equal parts. One is for spring crops, one is for summer crops, and two are for the crops, cover crop fallow period. And then we're rotating between those four areas each year. So for the first year, if we started out with spring cash crops like broccoli, et cetera, that would go to the summer cover crop that I described, the sorghum, Sudan grass, et cetera. And then that would go then to the winter cover crop. So that would all be in one year. Then the next year would be a whole fallow period of cover crops with the same you know, summer cover crop to winter cover crop mix. Then year three would go to a summer cash crop. Could be tomatoes, peppers, et cetera. Then back to the winter cover crop in September of the, uh, the oats, et cetera. And then again, in year four, another year of cover crop and fallow back to year five spring cash crops. But in this case, we'd really try to emphasize those spring, spring cash crops being something different. So maybe potatoes or carrots or lettuce, um, but we have a really fun and large Excel <laughs> spreadsheet that we use to kind of monitor uh, what has been in each bed over I think at this point we're on a six or seven year period. So, you know, the reason for thinking about inputs for us is both, as I said, kind of philosophical and practical, but also we live along this really special, um, very clean and pristine Ozark stream in Northeastern Oklahoma. And everything we do is obviously going to impact that stream. So um, since we'd always been concerned about using animal manure, uh, we also got an infestation of large scale chicken manure uh, or chicken poultry operations. And a lot of manure comes from that starting in 2018. And that was that was also a big impetus for us to start thinking even more concretely about our own inputs. Um, I also served on a board for organic standards that looked at organic inputs. And that was an eye opener for me just to see, you know, kind of what goes into a lot of these inputs and their impact. And ultimately we felt like we were just kind of giving a place for the chicken industry to place its wastes. So that was, so that's where the philosophical journey that brought us to where we are. And so I'll just say in conclusion that we, you know, we are very much in the experimental phase and we do not pretend to have any answers. Um, there are many people who have come before us who have much more experience um, and who've been doing something similar for a long time as well. So for us, I guess the next two to three years on this system will be really telling. Uh, so far, our soil test results are positive, and hopefully it will continue to be that way. And I look forward to exploring this a little bit more when we get into the question and answer period. So thank you. Thank you, Emily. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, we got, we'll have some good questions whenever we all come back together. Um, so Dave Scott. Um, I'd like I'd like you to be able to share your screen and introduce uh, yourself and your farm and kind of uh, what you're doing in Southwest Montana. <laughs> okay, Lee, I'm going to try to share it. Uh, yeah, can everybody see that? There it is. Oh, great. Well, I'm 70, you guys, so I'm surely not very good at the IT stuff. You don't look it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, my wife and I farm in Whitehall, Montana. Um, it is about 25 miles from the headwaters of the Great Missouri River. We are elevate, or our farmer's elevation is about 4,200 feet above sea level. To put that into context, uh, in the last two months, we we have had four major winter storms, each of which we've reached below 30 below zero wind chill. So we are a far piece away from where Emily is. Um, 
We also differ in that we have one crop only, and that is grass. We have 200 ewes that eat that grass. Basically, seven to eight months out of the year, we start grazing mid-May and we end our grazing uh, first of February. We've been regenerative grazing now since 2014. And I should mention also that we sell 300 lambs a year to a direct market in about 100 miles of a radius from our farm. Um, these lambs are, we sell mostly cuts to restaurants, a grocery store, a food hub, and uh, Montana State University. In 2013, or I guess I should uh, begin by a history of our farm. In 1982, we started here with 50 uh, Guernsey and Jersey cows, and it we made the farm a grass-based farm for those cows. Uh, we moved them twice a day to a new paddock after each milking. In 2003, we sold the milk cows and bought 200 ewes. For about six years, we ran those ewes just like we ran the milk cows, and we ran into numerous problems. In 2010, we switched uh, from a 22-day pasture rest to a 32-day, mainly to fight off the barber pole worm, which is an intestinal parasite that sheep are very susceptible to, and we were having to uh, deworm our lambs and use all of them every month in order to keep them alive. And obviously we woke up one morning and said, why are we doing this? Something's gotta be changed. And so that's when we went to a 32 day pasture rest system and it had a lot of effect. Um, our barber pole worm uh, infection rate went way down. The third uh, milestone of our farm's history happened in 2013 when I heard Dr. Christine Jones and Gabe Brown speak about what now has become regenerative agriculture and how you can grow 200 bushel corn uh, with no synthetic in. And that has changed everything for us. Let's see, how do I advance, Lee? You'll probably just hit, if you hit okay. enter, it'll probably do it. There you go. Okay, there we go. So we transitioned off of uh, 160 units of actual N per season uh, to zero in, in four years. And since 2017, uh, we have also experienced 25% less, less need for irrigation. That was something we didn't even think about when we were trying to get off the fertilizer bandwagon. It just happened, mainly because we're trampling much more grass than we used to, and it put a roof on the soil for us, keeping that soil moisture in. So I wanted to take a little tour today of our farm uh, using three rules that we have uh, discovered to guide us in our regenerative grazing system. The first rule is daily moves. That creates a very high stocking density of about 750 animals per acre. The second rule is take half and trample half. And the third rule is 42 days of pasture rest. Our infrastructure, it consists of irrigation pivots. We have two very small pivots that irrigate about 12 acres apiece, and on the uh, other eight acres that we have, it's all um, hand line, which um, we move uh, daily. And then you can see in this slide here too, this, this slide was taken in 2005 um, in our old way of, of grazing. You can see the nets that contain the sheep. Um, those nets keep the sheep in and the coyotes out. So they work very effectively. This, this Slide here shows what our pasture typically look like each day when we turn the sheep into it. It was on a 22 day pasture rest and we were using 160 units of actual N over the whole grazing season. All you need for regenerative grazing 
is plants, soil, sunlight, and water. That uh, was a hard thing for me to take in 10 years ago when I was used to applying 160 units of actual N for 30 some years. And when Gabe Brown told me that and reiterated it, I thought, oh, I don't know about this. Um, however, it's true. And all you have to do is add the herbivores, in our case, sheep. So a regenerative system, as we've come to know it, um, consists of letting the plants um, run the show and letting the soil microbes do the work. And all we do is sit back and watch. Oh, I should say this slide here is taken about um, the first of June, first week in June, you can see the grass is all headed out. Uh, it's 30 or 40, 35 inches tall there. And I used to think of grass like this as having no milk in it and no gain in it. However, we've come to realize that uh, the sheep or cattle know where the energy and the protein is in these plants and they eat that part of the plant. So my worries of mature grass have dissolved and I tend to look at, at mature grass as a tool now to improve our soil health. So let's take a little tour. Uh, we're gonna start in, the, in the, the first day of turnout in the spring. And we're gonna, we're gonna try to, to set our grazing system such that we have 42 days of rest between paddock grazings. And this is going to help let the plants run the show because the longer they can or photosynthesize, the more fo um, root exudates they put into the soil and this feeds our microbes. It's also going to uh, allow us to trample a little more mature grass which when trampled, it stays on the ground flat, which gives us a roof to, to uh, optimize the temperatures in the soil for microbial existence and optimize soil moisture retention. So when we were transitioning, we thought, okay, we're now on a 32 day rest period. How do we get 42 days? Well, the answer was you just wait seven days in, uh, before you turn your sheep out. And this is this picture here shows us, shows what we are turning out to, how tall the grass is. It's about 12 inches tall. It's pretty dense. There's about 2,200 pounds of dry matter per acre. We do a lot of uh, measuring of, of grass yields about every five days, just so we know what's out there in terms of yield. With a NRCS hoop, takes about 15 minutes to take a measurement and then it's all dumped into a spreadsheet. High stocking density is the next rule that we try to um, use. This picture here shows basically 750 animals on two thirds of an acre, or excuse me, 500 animals on two thirds of an acre. This is what it looks like. You can see there's lots of sheep there and they have the capacity to to eat lots of grass. And every time they take a bite there of that grass, there's root exudates that are emitted from the roots. And when they leave the paddock, it's pretty well trampled as we will see. So how do we get the high stocking density? We move daily. And this is what that same paddock looks like after a 24 hour graze. You can see there's lots of grass that's trampled here, trampled flat. And that's providing our second pathway of feeding um, the soil microbes is they're decomposing that flattened grass. And if you were to look at this field in September, you will that had been grazed three times, you will see three layers of decomposition there. The first layer is almost non-existent. The second layer is very brown. And the third layer is the grass that, that's growing and going to be grazed. So we try to always take half and trample half. 
So in summary, we've begun to learn that tall grass equals money. This is a picture here of grass that's mainly about the middle of August. Um, it has grown for 42 days. There's about 5,000 pounds of dry matter per acre here. And this is what we turn into uh, our sheep into. Contrast that with this slide again. This was taken in 2005 under our old system of grazing of 22 days of pasture rest, a lot of fertilizer. There's about 3,000 pounds of dry matter here. And whenever I run into a problem, I bookmark these two slides because I ask myself, if I was a sheep, would I, would I rather eat this grass or that grass? And so it gives me a lot of impetus to solve problems so I can, can let our sheep grow this grass instead of that grass. Here's a table of the outcomes that we've observed in out-of-pocket costs since 2017. Um, our first year of no fertilizer, 2022, um, our last season. So we have six seasons here. We've reduced our fertilizer from 160 pounds to acre to zero. That has gained us at last spring's prices for urea at $160 per acre. We were using ammonia nitrate and it was more than that, believe me. Um, our irrigation energy has been reduced uh, by 30 some dollars an acre. And this has come about mainly because we, the trampled grass retains soil moisture. Our winter grazing, that 42 uh, day of pasture rest has given us about 30 more days of winter grazing than we had on a 32 day pasture rest system. And so the old adage that you might read of one day or one week uh, that you can wait to turn out gives you a month more grazing. That's what we've experienced. So if you add all these up, it comes out to $275 an acre of savings that we've experienced. And the really neat thing about it is it shows up in the bank account at the end of the year. It's not just theoretical. Um, so am I happy? I have to say that I'm very happy. My dog tail is wagging. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dave. Um, I, I never tire of hearing your story, that's for sure. Okay, Thank here you. we are. Yeah, here we are all, all back. So, so th this is gonna be a, a fun part. We'll take the next about a half an hour um, to just kind of have a conversation about what you guys are doing. We've had a couple of questions come in that we'd like to certainly address, but one of them that I have for both of you um, to think about is, you know, you're you're both reducing nitrogen fertilizer in some in some manner. Um, you know, and and I guess I'm interested in how you're quantifying the nitrogen that you have. So I wonder if you could both speak to like any soil monitoring or testing to you do that you do, right? What are your indicators uh, that are important for you to look at? And do you somehow quantify or obtain data to account for nitrogen, you know, carryover from covers or anything? Or how do you know that, you know, covers or in your case, Dave, your perennial pastures, you know, have crop nutrients that are present and available for use? Dave, do you want to start? Okay, sure, Emily. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And it's one when we that we asked ourselves when we were transitioning uh, from off of a heavily fertilized system to uh, one of zero N. I might add too that with, with the sheep or cattle, phosphorus and uh, potassium are, are, they're just so much in the system, we don't worry about them. Our main concern was nitrogen. And so what we did is we used the Haney test. And the Haney test is a, uh, a biological test that predicts how much nitrogen will be 
uh, mineralized in your soil biologically over the next 60 days to 90 days. And so we take that a sample uh, from our soil uh, at the end of June every year. We figure we can at least make it to June with nitrogen in the soil. Um, and then the Haney test says, well, you've got 100 to 120 actual units of N that's going to be mineralized over the next uh, 60 days. And we look at our demand for what the animals are going to, or the going to need to eat. And it's it's usually about three tons from July, August, and or July and August. And we've got it because grass only takes about 30, 30 pounds of N uh, to produce a ton of dry matter. So we've relied heavily on the Haney test and it has worked very well for us. We, we trust it implicitly. Mm. So Dave, on that Haney test, do they use something like a CO2 burst or something on there to get an estimate of like of, of biological activity and make inferences? Yes, they do. About nitrogen? Is that yeah, what they it's do? a lot like the test that uh, Mark mentioned. Um, uh, I think it was Southern South Carolina research is doing. It's yeah, a three, it's a, pardon? North Carolina. North Carolina, yeah. And it's been around for a while, but it's it's based on uh, oil microbial respiration rates and a few other things uh, also. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. I, we've come to depend on it entirely. We test every June. And you have to have, the thing is, is you have to take the samples when it's 65 degrees soil temperature or more. It has to be active. Right. Right. Emily, what about what about your practices? Yeah, I mean, well, since we're certified organic, we have to take an annual soil test. Um, just that's part of our regulations. And we've been doing that from the beginning. I will say that over the over years, we've we've done both cooperative extension, we've done various different labs, we've done various different, you know, sort of parameters. And you can give the same soil sample to different labs and get different <laughs> results because I know mm -hmm. I've done it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, at this point, I think, I mean, we're using actually Waypoint Analytical, if anybody cares particularly mm -hmm. about that lab. Um, and, you know, looking at a host of micronutrients in addition to NPK and soil organic matter and I mean, I think this is for us where some of the faith part of this comes in because, you know, it's a soil sample will tell you if you're in, you know, the optimal range or the normal range for whatever vegetable crops you're growing. Um, but I mean, I'm not a soil scientist, but I'm just going to say this. I actually, I don't think that you need to apply or have evident in your soil sample results, the like, you know, high to optimal range to get a decent yield, maybe not over a sustained period of time. But I think if we look at our soil test results and try to make sure that we're putting in the same amount of nutrients that, you know, would indicate optimal range for whatever crop you're growing, we're kind of looking at it in, in some ways in a very like conventional think mentality. So, for us right now, I'd say, you know, seeing how NPK change or remain stable over time has been important, and they've been pretty stable over the last five-ish years, and soil organic matter. But for us, we're in a really hot summer climate, and it can be dry, it can be tropical, it can be any of those, it can be all of those in one season. So soil organic matter for us is a bit more challenging, and i don't just think it's because we do some tillage. I think it's also because we are just in a very prolonged, warm, wet growing period. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we're up there at the 3% range, we're extremely excited. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, yield obviously is an important indicator for us. And um, I think what our tests have been showing us at least for the past several years is that we still have an optimal amount of not everything I mean we are actually like low in sodium for example 
Um, <laughs> but an optimal amount of of enough of the micronutrients and NPK to feel confident um, that we don't need to be supplementing in. So that's not mm -hmm. a super technical reply to that mm -hmm. answer. It's just a pragmatic look at what we've got in front of us. Exactly the way I do it, I think. Very pragmatic <laughs> as opposed to scientific, right? But um, but I've I've heard you talk, you know, about you know where you do supplement because you grow a lot of your own fertility on your farm, right? And uh, you may bring in a little bit for those heavy feeders, right? And I wonder if you can talk to just uh, what your strategy is there, and perhaps some of those crops, and and maybe even some of the the, the in sources that you're currently using. Some of the in sources, is yeah. That what yeah. yeah, so the only in source that we're using right now, besides the legumes um, in the cover crop mix, which are significant, because we have done soil test results after cover cropping and seen, you know, really high amounts of nitrogen being fixed to the acre, up to 200 pounds per mm -hmm. acre, depending mm -hmm. upon, you know, if it's a, a straight legume cover crop and the type of cover crop or uh, the type of legume. Um, but the only end source that we're really using is this pelleted soybean meal on tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, and that's it. Right. Um, and that's just a one-time side dressing, you know, like a half a cup at most, maybe a quarter to half a cup per plant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ironically, like sometimes you will see a higher soil organic matter because we did take some soil tests this summer during the middle of the season because we'd had such a difficult droughty well from a very cold and wet spring to a very dry and hot summer and the plants weren't particularly happy with that and we we did wonder like is this a consequence of what we're doing you know are these plants kind of slow to grow because we're not giving them what they need mm -hmm. but we had you know like almost five percent soil organic matter at that point just in the tomato beds unmulched and you know optimal nutrients of everything so I mean, really that side dressing was probably more for our own peace of mind than right. it was based on the actual results from the soil test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, basically we, I mean, like the One Straw Revolution author, I don't know if anybody's read that guy, mm -hmm. Masanobu Fukuoka, but he, he used a lot of herbicides for a lot of years before he got to the place where he was able to, you know, reduce and, and get rid of tillage. Whereas in our case, like, I'll be completely honest, you know, we used chicken manure and we used other sources of organic minerals and nutrients to get us to the place where now, you know, we kind of have that built up in our soil bank, so to speak. How long that will persist over the next five to 10 years, you know, that's, that's where Mark will jump in and probably say we'll definitely need to apply compost and maybe some other things at some point. So we'll just have to see, but, you know, applying lime because of our acidic soils every few years is for me like low on the totem pole of, of things that I wish I weren't doing. It's, it's more just that mentality of like, oh, I've got to be sure that my soil test results are in combination with what's expected for these crops, like kind of obsessively or to the point where I'm applying based on results on paper, not necessarily on what I'm seeing in the field mm -hmm. in terms of healthy plants and healthy harvests. Right, right. I tend to be that way too. Whenever you said that sometimes you fertilize for yourself, I find that I do that as well. It transplant, you know, just a little, just a little organic something. And uh, but that's all my 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 covers are are taking care of it as well. Um, but I I could totally relate to that. I wonder, um, Dave. I wonder, Dave, if we can talk a little about um, about what you're doing um, specifically with with the lambs uh, with with the sheep. If we've had some questions come in about you know, where are they from like February? Where are they now, right? Where are they from February to May? Do you have a sacrifice pasture? How do you deal uh, with pasture, like uh, that with, 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 you know, pasture resiliency over the year? Um, you know, where do these animals go whenever there's not green growing grass? And granted, this is Montana, but it's not upland. This isn't dryland where it's, you only have 60 to 90 days of growth. You're on irrigated fields. Right. Yeah, Lee, I, I, we have, uh, we, 
we do, according to NRCS hoops, about seven tons the acre on our irrigated pastures. Um, our general schedule, uh, we turn out mid-May, somewhere between the 15th and the 20th, just depending on how, how cold it is up here. Mm -hmm. um, we can get snow in June. So, um, but generally around mid-May, the grass is starting to kick in and, and start growing. Mm -hmm. um, the lambs are by their used sides till August 1st when we wean the lambs. And then at that time, the uh, lambs stay on our pastures and the used target graze our neighbor's uh, leafy spurge, which is a noxious weed that cattle won't eat but sheep do really well on it, mm -hmm. <laughs> luckily. <laughs> and so the ewes are off of our place from about August 1 to October 15, mm -hmm. which does give our home pasture time to, um, to get ahead of the lambs. And that's where a lot of our winter grass is produced. Mm -hmm. um, so does that answer your question, Lee? Was there more to it than that? No, I think so. There were, you know, asking about that and then, you know, uh, about any type of sacrifice, you know, pasture that, that you might have during that time. Did, did you say they go off the farm? Yeah, the ewes go off the farm to neighboring ranches, mainly on the river, the river bottom where there's lots of leafy spurge. Mm -hmm. um, they're there about two and two months, a little more than okay. two months. Okay. Yep, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's basically a trade uh, of our sheep eating leafy spurge. So for every acre of leafy spurge they eat, they get an acre of free grass. Yeah. So it's <laughs> it's a good deal for the ranchers because after several years, there's much more grass than there used to be. And it's a really good deal for us. And mm -hmm. the best thing about it is there's no money that changes hands. Yeah. You know, yeah. because cattle ranchers really dislike an animal that can take uh, what they have some of that their cattle won't mm -hmm. eat. <laughs> yeah. I, so, I, I, well, I remember back in the early 2000s, I was a part of the team, the MSU team that did some of those leafy spurge trials. And we were putting up exclusions and stuff in grazing studies. And over the course of three years, we actually did notice that the leafy spurge uh, uh, composition in on the rangeland decreased where we had run bands of sheep through at least two times at flowering. Yeah, it right. is amazing. You can't kill it because it has a 25 foot deep root. Yes. So the only thing you can do is either spray it or graze it with sheep and goats. And uh, all three methods manage it, but you, the spraying doesn't kill it either. You're gonna come have, have to come yeah. back and spray it. Yeah. So for people that, that want to be a little more ecologically uh, with it, they will get goats or sheep in there. And mm -hmm. uh, the, the effect is the same after, We've been on these two places, one place for about nine years and another place for six years, I think it is. And I really wished I would have taken a picture of when we first started mm -hmm. because it was like three to four feet tall in the first of August when we came. And now it's about 10 inches. Mm -hmm. So it really does reduce it. It doesn't kill it, but it really reduces it. And the grass has, it's given the, the grass a chance to come back. Right, right. Yeah. Well, good. So, so Emily, you know, there's been some questions here on on cover crops, and sure. I'm I'm interested if you have an opinion on using cover crop mixtures versus a pure stand, right? Of just like a single monoculture cover crop, um, both from like you know what you can get economically from that with nutrient carryover or whatever, and just as a practical standpoint of what you can actually do on the farm. What is your opinion of of, of that? Well, I'll, I'll give you an example of the fall winter cover crop. So um, we have an oat that is a winter kill oat, um, but it and the forage radish and the mustard will really get established nicely every September, October, November, and they're growing pretty, pretty vigorously. And depending upon when we get our first several hard freezes, the oats are going to start to die back, but they then perform this function of a mulch and a protective cover for the vetch and the clover that have germinated 
and been growing, but very slowly under the shade mm -hmm. of the other crops. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just also not in their optimal conditions at that point, but they're alive. And then over the course, you know, of sort of the December, January period, the oats in particular are really forming a protective layer. And by the time the daylight hours increase in February, the warmth starts to increase, the rainfall is there, the vetch and clover just take off and become, you know, they become in essence like, you know, a, a two crop mix at that point. And mm -hmm. they become two to three feet tall by May. And we just let that cover grow throughout the spring. And we kind of use it as a spring cover crop in essence at that point. Mm -hmm. And then we mow down a section as we're about to need it, to plant into it. We'll till it optimally like one to two weeks before we need to make the bed and plant into it. Of course, weather is not mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. <laughs> favorable to that. Um, and then the, so it's just basically everything that's not getting turned into a bed to get planted into veggies is still staying under that oat or not the oat, sorry, the vetch and clover mix. Mm. So, you know, in addition to what it's doing for the soil life, and I mean, there's plenty of information out there about why it's better to have a more complicated mix, you know, just practically speaking, it's providing us with, in essence, like two different cover crops in one. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, I've said this and I think people probably think I'm crazy, but the holy grail would be to find native grasses, legumes, and wildflowers mm -hmm. to try to experiment with, especially for the summer cover crop period. I don't think we'd find anything that can give us the biomass that the sorghum sudan grass can give us mm -hmm. in such a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. But it, there might be other benefits um, that might outweigh getting less vegetative mass. But mm -hmm. um, I mean, <laughs> So yeah, I could go deeper into that. Yeah. Um, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, summer, I'm gonna actually back off. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you get deeper into that because, um, and and ask you to because you know Mark talked a little bit about you know no till versus till, and you have to terminate your covers, right? Yeah. Um, so I wonder if you'd speak to your experience about that and what you think is the best way that's that 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 you know terminating covers is working for you. Yeah, so I'll just continue like the fall winter cover crop. I mean, it's terminating itself in essence mm -hmm. because of the winter conditions for the oats and the radish and the mustard to some extent, although they can kind of come back and give us a little extra growth in the spring, depending upon the winter. And then the vetch and the clover are super easy to terminate just, well, for one, they're going to kind of terminate themselves when they start to flower and then we mow them down. They're not going to really grow back at that point. Um, and they then become this really thick and, and beautiful mulch that almost no weeds will grow or germinate into over the course of the summer. So last summer we had such a severe drought that we were unable to come in and, and plant the summer cover crop when we normally would have. We had to wait quite a few more weeks, mm -hmm. but we still mm -hmm. had great cover. We still had a lot of vegetative matter through that mulch from the vetch and the clover and still had a lot of weed suppression from that. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the summer cover crop, um, wait, remind me of the question again, cause you know. Uh, I'm getting into the whole tillage question and terminating yep. crops, you know? So, yeah, I mean, we've, we've had some years where the summer cover crop has gone 10, 11 feet high we've broken machines trying to mow it down <laughs> mm -hmm. and um you know we had one year where it was so thick we couldn't plant the fall winter cover crop in a timely fashion because the vegetative matter was just so massive from the summer cover crop and you know first we thought oh this will be a good experiment we'll kind of see what happens if we don't plant the summer cover crop on these fields and we like just kind of keep mowing and regrowing the sorghum sudan grass in particular mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um over the course of the fall and and while you know we did get a lot of vegetative matter we did not have in my opinion enough cover by the time springtime came around and then you know late spring and early summer came around before we got the next summer cover crop planted. 
-hmm. So we learned at that point, like, okay, wait, we don't want to let it get so big that we can't get in there when we want to get in there in, you know, mid September with our fall winter cover crop. So we will, you know, not terminate it, but mow it down mm -hmm. in mid to late August, just depending upon the year and the type of growth that we're getting. We'll get a really nice flush of additional top growth and we'll let that go another two-ish feet high before we'll mow it down again. Mm -hmm. And it will just keep going. Like at this point, these are these are cover crops that if you don't till them in, mm -hmm. like they're they're gonna keep coming back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where tillage for us is necessary. And in an ideal world, we'll just use a disc, a light disking, and then mm -hmm. come in with our grain drill. We do not have a no-till grain drill. But um, we will experiment with some of our field this year from the summer cover crop, mowing it down, getting it mowed down nice and close, and then coming in with the grain drill at maybe like double the seeding rate to see if we can avoid tillage at that point. Because mm -hmm. we don't have a weed problem that we're trying to address. The cover crop has been a smother crop and has mm -hmm. gotten rid of weeds at that point. Um, it's just a matter of whether or not all of the the seeds in the fall winter cover crop are going to respond well to that heavy amount of vegetative matter that's there. I mean, our, our big experiment with that has already taken place to some extent because when we're driving the grain drill from one bed or from one field to the next field, we drive over our Bermuda infested mm -hmm. driveway mm -hmm. and we still get really great growth <laughs> from because we don't lift up the drill at that point. So, I mean, if we're seeing pretty good growth from the grain drill in our driveway, I feel like, you know, we might be able to see some success with double the seeding rate in the crop residue of the summer cover crop. Mm. Well, I could keep talking about that forever, for sure. Um, I, I'm, I, and I have so many other questions for you, Emily. Maybe I'll just email them to you. Please. And then, and, and then post them on our website or something. I don't know. But I, but for Dave, you know, um, I, a question came in, and this is a good one. You know, do you feel confident that your approach would work in a situation that wasn't irrigated? I do, but there's some caveats to that. And, you mm -hmm. know, water drives things as much as carbon does. Mm -hmm. And so you can do the same thing using the same principles in a dry land situation, you know, even down to 10 inches of rainfall a year. Mm -hmm. But you're going to have to be, um, you're going to have to do the same principles. You're going to have to have a long, long rest period, which probably in a dry land situation in the upper, you know, the the northern tier of the west here, it's going to be a year instead of 42 days. Some places in more brittle environments in the southwest, it may take two years. Mm -hmm. But um, the same principle of high stocking density will will trample that grass that you need to trample and you don't want to eat more than half of it. So I think the same principles will work almost everywhere because if you think about it, when the bison ro roamed the, the whole country, you know, from here to Georgia, they are constantly on the move with predators. Mm -hmm. So we're just, all we're doing is imitating that with our fences and moving mm -hmm. the sheep. And so, I, I have friends here in Montana that are on, uh, say, 13 to 15 inches of annual rainfall, and they're doing the same thing we are, uh, using the same principles, and they're enjoying the same success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I know out in, in my part of the world in the, in the mid-Atlantic, um, you know, usually the amount of rainfall is not an issue. It's just when it comes. You know, and last year was really tough. That past couple of years have been kind of tough. You know, all the summer rain seems to want to come in September, you know, yeah. and that makes it that makes that makes it a little difficult to maintain those those cool season crops, um, you know, pastures um, humming along. But, um, I, you know, I, there's some regenerative grazers out here who have been like building their soil over years where they're still able to uh, 
you know, these are these are ranchers here that are raising grass fed beef, um, you know, like you guys, uh, farming, ranching and and actually being profitable and supplying the needs of their family with no off farm income. Um, it's amazing you can do that. Um, you know, with this type of system and, 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 you know, small farm viability is just my passion and I'm happy to, to, to talk to folks like you and to see how you do it. So um, I will say that it is 201 um, and I could keep this going, like I said, Emily, for, for quite a while. Uh, it, talking with both of you is fascinating. Um, but, you know, what I want to do right now is just thank you both for joining us. Um, Emily and Dave, your, your, your contributions and your, 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 your knowledge, your, it, it's, and your willingness to share it is just so appreciated. And I know that um, everyone else feels the same. You can, you can find these guys online, I'm sure. Um, I don't know if you have a website, Dave. But uh, but I know Emily, you do. Do you have a website, or how's a good way to people to get in touch with you? You, Dave. Oh me. Um, yeah. I don't have a website. Um, however, you uh, in on our slide, if you're showing, if are these slides going to be readily accessed, Lee? Or um, yeah, or and, yeah. In fact, I'd like to send out an email to everybody at the you know as well, and I can give them your contact if that's what you want. Yeah, on the last slide is our contact. It's just cool. Montana Highland Lamb at yahoo.com. Cool, yeah. cool. And 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 what's what's yours, Emily? It's farmers at three springs farm.com and three is spelled out. Very cool. <laughs> yes. So again, I really appreciate you guys. Um, what we're going to do right now is launch a brief poll so that you so that uh, everyone can provide some feedback on how you think today's session went. We really appreciate your input. It 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 helps us to to do a better job each time and to and and just to continually uh, to continually improve. Like I've heard Emily say about the organic program so many times. Um, but I'll give you guys a chance. Uh, you're welcome to take this poll. Um, we would really appreciate it. Um, here shortly after the poll, uh, we're going to have like a little optional networking period um, if you'd like to stay and um, kind of continue some of the discussion with some of some of your peers for about for about 25 minutes or so. We won't be on long, but if you're interested, we would love to, to have you with us on the optional period just to network and share some of the observations, some of your takeaways, the things that you learned perhaps um, today from our excellent speakers. Um, also, I would like, you know, to, to, to let everybody know that NCAT has produced a toolkit for how to reduce synthetic fertilizer use with lots of publications and podcasts and resources and tools to help you think through how you might be able to reduce the use of synthetic fertilizer on your farm if you're interested. And that's, uh, that is a resource that you can get from atra.ncat.org. So again, thanks for joining us for the third annual NCAT conference, Growing Hope. And I hope you guys feel hopeful. I certainly do after, after listening to our presenters today. Don't forget, you can also, in addition to possibly staying around for the optional um, uh, networking, you can continue the conversation at our forum at atra.ncat.org slash forum. That's a really good tool for people to just ask questions from each other. So uh, we look forward to seeing all of you back here on Tuesday, March 7th for our next exciting session, which is going to be on agroforestry. And I have said that I think agroforestry is going to be the word of the year. So let's see. Um, there's an awful lot of good that can come from, from this type of production practice. We'll be hearing from author Eric Tonsmeyer and Kate McFarland and Gary Bentra from the USDA and Ellie Honan of Coastal Roots Farm and Joan O'Niger of Big, of Big River Chestnuts. Um, so again, uh, thank you. We appreciate everyone's attendance. 